I think that there there's a difference between recognizing that a human life has value and therefore a baby is a blessing versus it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you feel fulfilled and this just falls into place and you think life is great. And yeah, it does not mean that at all. And I think that we have, I mean, always, always, we have to be able to hold two truths simultaneously that children are a blessing and it's not the right choice for everyone. And we have to hold both of those things at the same time as real truths. Hi guys, and welcome to the House Call Vet Cafe podcast. I'm Dr. Eve Harrison. I'm a full-time integrative concierge house call veterinarian in Los Angeles, and I help other vets to build their unique mobile practices on their terms. This podcast is for and by house call and mobile veterinarians. So it is meant to give our community a platform to connect, to share our stories, to lift each other up and to support each other. Most of us work solo as lone wolves, right? (laughs) So for me, it's been really powerful to be able to physically hear the voices of my colleagues from all over the world and to get a chance to feel that we truly are part of a community of very real other human beings who get it. While you may be alone in that little bubble of your own vehicle when you're on the road seeing patients, I welcome you to join our community by tuning into our own podcast when you're on your way to your next house call. Whether you're a super experienced house call vet with 30 years of experience, you're a brand new prospective house call vet just looking to get started, or you're house call curious, there will be something for you in this podcast. Each episode, you will hear interviews from other mobile veterinarians just like yourself who are doing unique and innovative things, vets who are sharing their stories, their struggles and challenges, and you can also look forward to hearing valuable information and perspectives from specialists and experts outside of our micro niche. And finally, if becoming a house call veterinarian is something that you've been thinking about exploring, or you're looking for some extra support getting your own mobile practice to feel more profitable and sustainable for you, check out the information in the show notes about my course and our above and beyond supportive private community for members only, plus our monthly group coaching sessions within the House Call Vet Academy. You can also check out my free public Facebook group, which is also called the House Call Vet Cafe, the same name as this podcast, and which is a warm and cozy community for mobile vets to support each other in professional and personal development, in creative entrepreneurship, and in friendship. So thank you guys for spending time with me today. Let's dive into the episode. Welcome back to part two of our episode with Emily Yunker who is a veterinary birth doula and pretty much everything else that exists on this earth is what she is. So (laughs) needless to say, we have three episodes that our recording got separated into because there's just so much good stuff to say and to discuss. So here's episode two. I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everyone. We have an amazing guest today that I've been really excited about speaking with for a while. And I think you guys will be really excited to hear this episode, too. We have the amazing Dr. Emily Yunker, DVM, CVMRT, CVH doula, who is a vet and a mom and a whole lot more. She works full time in rehabilitation and integrative medicine, while still sometimes working in ER medicine. She's also the veterinarian doula, a role that has her working with moms who are vets everywhere from fertility and conception planning through those first rough weeks back at work, and especially in the weeks immediately before and after birth. The connecting strand in everything she does is holistic wellness, consideration for the whole being within the context of their environment and their relationships. It works for professionals, families, animals, workplaces, politics, and everything. Welcome, Emily. You're a phenomenal human being, and we've been following each other for a while, and I'm just so excited that we're finally having this conversation, and I wanted to welcome you to the show. Thanks, Eve. I'm so excited to be here. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to veer off script a tiny little bit. I did give you a little heads up, but like just before our call, I was like, oh, I know what we're going to do about it. And it's a little bit like kind of like selfish because like it's something that just weighs on my mind personally. I'm kind of pulled to talk with you about the decision to have children to begin with. 
for veterinarians, especially given what you said so beautifully in the beginning, like we have these type A perfectionists, we get into a little bit of black and white thinking, you know, we've got a tendency towards having children on the later side because our career has come first for so long, or we don't have the resources available until later with our loans. Like there's a million reasons that having children for a veterinarian, like let alone like our mindset of adoption versus having children, spay neuter, <laughs> like, you know, there's like a million different directions that the decision to have children or not to have children is like really interesting for a veterinarian. And I wanted to kind of maybe share just like a shred of my own journey with you and our listeners, just because, I mean, I think for all of us to hear each other's stories is helpful. And I would say my decision about motherhood has been like kind of twisty, turny, windy. It's had, I've gone in this direction, I've gone in that direction. And I think to some extent for most women, there's elements of that, if not the whole full like range and spectrum of experiences in that decision making process. And in my case, there's a few factors that went into my current status right now, which is like the career heavily, heavily I was like, I don't know that there's room in my life for this heavy fucking career and to be responsible for another human being. There's aspects of who I am that have gone like, is this uh, someone you're comfortable seeing another little one of you portraying these traits? <laughs> and, you know, like there's there's also been family history and a million partners that didn't work out and how that all went down. And I think that's gotten me to where I am right now in terms of like my heart and my emotions about my relationship to motherhood. And then even kind of in my early 40s, like there's also something else pulling at my heartstrings. I was just like, oh, geez, <laughs> my sister, um, I'm the oldest of three sisters. My middle sister just had a baby, the first of our family, the first baby of our immediate family. And she had also a traumatic experience, but just being so close to this experience is like, okay, there's so much stirring in me right now. That's like, I mean, okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> and um, it's just, it's a lot of emotions. It's a whole spectrum. And I mean, for me, I just think it's really interesting to to talk to other people about their journeys, about whatever decision they've come to, how they got to that decision and like what's alive in them with like thoughts and questions and emotions. And I mean, there's also so many like kind of moving away from my own story, I guess, like there's so, so, so many women, especially in the veterinary space who are uncertain about having children or maybe they are certain about having kids, but they're having trouble conceiving. Like we're under a tremendous amount of stress. We've waited till later in life than, you know, because of our profession and the demands. There's people who maybe can't, you know, they're getting pregnant, but they can't hold the pregnancy because of all of what's going on. And then there's people who, you know, our bodies have decided for us that can't have kids. Or there's people who, you know, they're absolutely certain that parenting a human child is not for them. But we're surrounded by mothers who are having an experience that we're not having. And there's an inherent little bit of tension there even. Um, and all of that is just like so very relatable to me because I've traveled that journey in, in my imagination in every possible direction. And I know this is like a huge question and topic. I, I know a lot of people in the veterinary space uh, of childbearing years have questions would you be able to share a little bit about sort of like the decision making process that women face in our profession, like regarding some of these things? I know I just like unleashed a huge can of baby worms. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think I'm going to actually take a slightly historical perspective on this for a second. I'm married to a historian, side note. And also, I really like history and I also like biology. And so almost everything I do involves history and biology. And if you combine those things together, we call that anthropology. And that's the whole field of study. And so I read all of these little things and then sort of gather them together in my head when I'm thinking about stuff. Because I think having a wider perspective can really help sometimes because we get so into what our lived experience is. And sometimes we lose track of all of the other possibilities. And that's just normal. But we have the capacity to look a little bigger sometimes and give ourselves perspective. And women have only had a choice about this for like 60 years. That's it. 
my God. Yeah. And most women were not actually actively using birth control until like the late 70s, which is when we were born, if you're a Gen Xer. <laughs> and <laughs> so yeah. like we are like the first generation to have to really think about this in this way. I just feel like we need to be real about this. We literally just haven't figured it out yet because no one's done this before. And then on top of that, because we had birth control options and because of all the feminists who came before us and the waves of feminists that came before us, and they were each problematic in their own way, but they each gave us gifts in their own way too, right? And the gifts they gave us was that we have options and we get to be professionals and we get to define our own identity. The cost that came with that is that now we have to make choices and we have to define our identities. And I literally typed out to someone yesterday in a Facebook group, you cannot be everything to everyone all the time. You have to choose what your priorities are based on your value system. And so I think that if I had a choice, everybody would take a lot of time to think about their value system. Now, have many people done that? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. How many people have really sat down and done that? Hugely depends on your family culture and where you got your education and stuff like that. But it's nice if you have, because when you get to have clarity around what your values are, when a decision comes up, you can ask yourself, how does this play into my value system? And sometimes it's a neutral and that's hard. And sometimes it's like, whoa, actually kind of none of these are my values or all of these are my values. And that does not clarify things. But for some people, it really does. For some people, they put so much emphasis on, I mean, productivity, so to speak, or on feeling that they have contributed positively to the world or on fulfilling like a spiritual sort of implication to something that it does really provide some clarity for them about where they want to go with this. But then there's a lot of us who, who that doesn't really do much with. <laughs> and I will say I fell into that category. But for me, and I think, I, I think I'm not going to say it's universal, but the feedback I get from people is that this is at least part of what comes into play is that at least on this life, and maybe you believe in reincarnation, but at least on this life, you only get really one choice about what you do with it. And for some people, they just feel like, I want the experience of being a parent. Like this is part of the experience I want to walk in this life. There's a great author of the Conscience Parenting book, Shafali is her last name. She was one of the Oprah people, so she's got a big name. But one of the things that she says all the time is that parenting is inherently selfish. Now, not the act of parenting, which is actually pretty selfless, but the decision to have children is almost always selfish. It is something that you want for your life. Unless you are pretty much a religious zealot of some kind or another, and you feel like you are making the kingdom come on earth, which there are, <laughs> there's plenty of people out there like that in all different religions. But there's, there is a religious component to some people's choice to have children. But aside from that, everybody else is making a decision because it's something they want for their life. It is not based upon somehow being better for the planet, better for the child, better for their family. They're making a decision based on something they want. And we try to justify that in a million different ways. Like we're like, but my children would, you know, they would make the world a better place or I would be a good mom and therefore I should do it. Or I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know the million ways that we justify this, but we do. But really what it comes down to is I just want to do it. But, and I'll be honest, that was me. Like my best friend is really different than me. And we did pre-med together. And at one point she thought she wanted to be a veterinarian and she realized she didn't. And so she went MD and I went DBM, but we have parallel journeys. And she asked me, you know, of course, those like two o'clock in the morning, like roommate questions. Why do you want to have kids? How do you know you want this? And I didn't have a great answer for her. I was just like, I would literally feel like I hadn't lived my life the way I wanted to without it. Like, even if I can't biologically do this, I will adopt and I will foster. And this is just the path I want. Like, I don't want to go through this life without having done this. And I run into quite a few people like that. And sometimes they know from the beginning, like I did. And sometimes they reach a certain point where they're just suddenly like, and frequently it's your late 30s, um, although that's a little bit of a stereotype that tends to be when it is. 
your hormones are starting to shift. You're starting to get wrinkles. Maybe you find some gray hairs. Maybe your periods get a little closer together and a little lighter. And you're like, holy shit, if I don't do this, I'm not going to get to do this. And then all of a sudden you have a burning desire to do it. And you must do it. I've definitely seen both spectrums here. <laughs> And then unfortunately, there are still quite a few people who do it for somebody else. Like they're, they marry someone who really, really, really wants kids and they're like, okay, fine, we'll do this. And I've known quite a few people who had regrets. Um, either people who thought they really, really, really wanted this and then they, they, it was harder than they thought it was going to be. Or people who did it because someone else wanted them to do it. I faced, and, I faced um, a situation like that in the past. And that was part of some very serious thinking that I had to do. But I relate very much to that. Yeah. And I suspect, but I do not know, that there are fewer people having children and regretting it than there used to be. But there was a study done like 15 years ago. So this would have been mostly Gen Xers who were answering the questions with a few of the older millennials maybe thrown in there who had kids young. And there was, a, I mean, an astonishing number. I mean, more than 15 percent, I think, of women who said that they regretted having a child. And maybe the, the way the question was answered was worded was a little vague. So it may mean that they regretted having one of their children. Like, you know, they intentionally had baby number one and then they had an unexpected pregnancy and they regretted having that extra pregnancy. And in that's enormous number, you know, because up until they did that study, I think that the narrative around motherhood was that even if it was unplanned, it was always a blessing. Like, end of story. and. I will, I mean, I will say that, I mean, I'm a lover of babies. <laughs> I do think every baby is a blessing, but I think that there's a difference between recognizing that a human life has value and therefore a baby is a blessing versus it doesn't mean that all of a sudden you feel fulfilled and this just falls into place and you think life is great. And yeah, it does not mean that at all. And I think that we have, I mean, always, always, we have to be able to hold two truths simultaneously that children are a blessing. And it's not the right choice for everyone. And we have to hold both of those things at the same time as real truths. And so, I mean, so I'm super awkward about this and really upfront about it. If you are, depending on your perspective, fortunate or unfortunate enough to shadow with me as a vet student or a pre-vet student, you will get a fertility lecture. <laughs> I tell all of the female shadowees who follow me around that infertility is incredibly common among veterinarians because we delay child rearing and we have high stress lifestyles. And we sometimes make more poor health decisions because of our high stress lifestyles. And so if you know you want children, you need to pursue that with the same intensity that you pursue veterinary medicine. It is not something that just happens on the side. It is intentional and you need to put work into it. On the other hand, you can lead a lovely, fulfilling, meaningful life without having children. So you don't need to have children, but if you want to have them, you need to do it. <laughs> and most of the time they just sort of look at me like, well, that was unexpected, but you would be amazed. <laughs> you would be amazed how many of them are like, whoa, I have seriously been thinking about this for years and no one has ever said this. And I'm like, yeah, we need to start talking about this. Tell your friends. <laughs> and then just the other day, I was at a big professional conference. A bunch of residents were there. And I'd forgotten how stressy residents are. God, they're so stressy. And I was like, Ugh, I'm really glad I'm not there. <laughs> but we were talking and one of them is being super proactive and having her eggs frozen. And I said, I am so proud of you. I, I don't know if anyone's ever said this to you, but I am so proud of you for being proactive about this. And for telling other people that you're doing this because we should be talking about this. Good jobs. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't think that there's easy answers here by any means. It's not easy. I don't know if that helped at all. <laughs> so much. I mean, I, I just love how you hold the two truths at once, like the duality and the knowing that not everything, it, it's no one size fits all. And I mean, I couldn't help as you were speaking the parallels between like, birthing a house call practice and birthing a they're obviously a hundred percent different like there's no comparison to birthing a human child right but I'm making the comparison anyway because I can't <laughs> but I, I fully you know respect the differences that are actually there but there's clear parallels 
And there's just so much that goes into both types of decisions. And I think that sort of prepping the, the body and the mind and the creating space and knowing this isn't something that just happens. You don't just like become an entrepreneur because you snap your fingers and you decide it's time. I mean, for some people, it it happens that way and it blows my mind. And I'm like also very, very proud of these people because like the sheer will, I want to do this. I'm doing it. It's done. I mean, for those people like, but, but not for everyone, you know, not for everyone. There's like almost like a, another like parallel of like infertility. Like I can't get the practice started because I'm too entrenched in everything else. And like my body just won't do it, you know, like at this point. So there's, there's so many like fascinating parallels here. And I, I love the story also about the resident that you spoke to that froze the eggs and your response. And I love that you talk to those students and like prepare them because there's so many things that we don't talk about in our profession that shock me every day. I mean, at this point, none, none of it's shocking because we know what our profession is and it's not okay to talk about things in on holistic terms, whole self terms. It's not normalized to consider whole life, whole presence, whole being like mental health, wellness, other than like pizza for lunch or like you have a compassion fatigue professional come and give a talk, which is like, that's the version of whole self-care. And it's like, yeah, no, that's clearly not sufficient. And so I'm just like mind blown that you, um, it's personal for you. Clearly, like you care about these people as whole people, like your reproductive health is being impacted by this profession. And if you're under my wing, I'm going to talk to you about it. Like, how beautiful is that? Hi, my name is Jonathan Lau. I'm the founder of O3Vets. One of the challenges of being a mobile veterinarian is that you have a more limited toolbox to draw from. At O3Vets, we put a powerful tool into your toolbox by providing ozone therapy equipment designed specifically to help the mobile veterinarian treat those tough cases. Ozone works as a redox molecule to help decrease inflammation and improve cellular communication. This has an incredibly beneficial effect on a variety of conditions as demonstrated through the hundreds of scientific studies available. If you would like to join thousands of veterinarians who've experienced the power of ozone therapy, you can visit O3Vets.com or call us at 517-925-8148. If you mention this ad, you'll get access to our online training course with the purchase of your ozone equipment. And then I also wanted to just kind of like bouncing back to another subject that you mentioned about corporate and non-corporate. You and everyone have my full, you know, I'm obviously very outspoken and I have a clear perspective about corporate practice. In an abstract sense, you and everyone that I know has my full blessing to do what needs to be done for you your body, your family, your financial, your retirement, like you do what you need to do. And I just wanted to like revisit something. Actually, my last podcast episode, I had sort of like thought through this idea. And now I've been kind of using this terminology. Corporate mindset is different from corporate Ooh. practice, right? Like you can have a corporate mindset in a private practice where they're taking advantage of you. They don't see your humanity. You're a cog in the wheel. You are meant to like impact the bottom line and that's it. You know, you it, it's just this templatey, like scaling at all costs, bring in the money at all costs, right? You can likewise, like you said, have a corporate practice that has a beautiful culture, depending on who the people are in it. Like your manager is just like a loving, empathetic person who sees the big picture and maybe they're struggling within the system on your behalf. Like that can be really beautiful. It's a corporate mindset that gets me where, I mean, it's essentially the opposite of what you and I believe in, which is like, when you engage in the world, whether that's professionally, like kind of from your bio, whether that's in politics, whether that's in working with animals, like we don't fragment in in these ways. Like we bring our whole self to every experience. And if the container that you're in, whether that's your place of employment or a brick and mortar where you're working, can't hold the whole of you, that's where another capital T trauma comes and the agency we have over our literal physical bodies our mental health, and of course, not to mention the bodies of our patients that we are deeply, deeply responsible for. 
that's where, you know, the, that loss of agency has a real, real impact on us. And so I wanted to thank you, like, from the bottom of my fucking heart <laughs> about how beautifully, like, you hold these things and just, like, even how you talk about it in your bio. So I know I just, like, said a lot of stuff. I have another question to ask you. Did you have anything you wanted to respond first before I shift a little bit? Yeah, I do. And that is your parallel between starting a practice or starting a business and having a baby. And I mean, yeah, they are. Obviously, they're different. But this is definitely sort of a tangent and it's not going to appeal to everybody. So just Mm -hmm. for people it doesn't appeal to, just, you know, like wait five minutes and we'll come back around. Okay. But part of being a doula, at least every doula I know, is that you really buy into this concept of like the sacred feminine and that there is something really like holy about this capacity to create and hold life. And that is not just a biological functionality. That is a metaphorical womb space. And there are so, so, so many women in the birthing world, midwives and doulas and educators who frequently refer to their work as the gestation birth and parenting process. And a few years ago, I did a group with Josie Buke. Oh, yeah. Uh, Yeah. And she asked me to come on and talk about parenting. And I was pregnant and immediately postpartum during the year that I did that program with her. And it was really powerful to be in this sort of supported space that was intentionally spiritual during that time. And one of the things that I brought to the table was that specifically came and talked about the power of the womb and how you can connect to your internal creative center and build up the energy reserves by taking care of yourself as you're preparing to bring something new into the world. And then how you have to care for yourself during and after that transition because the energy expenditure is enormous and it's life transformative. And it doesn't just happen. <laughs> and so I don't think you're at all off base there. And I mean, don't get me wrong. We, I mean, we kind of talked about this already. Their parenting can get all people everywhere, but parents are one of them, can get sort of protective and a little bit prickly about comparisons about parenting. And I have also felt that. But I also want to acknowledge that that is not like a made up thing. When we create something and put it out into the world, that is our inherent feminine creative energy. Like, that's just, that's just part of that whole cycle. So anyway, I felt like it was important to say that. <laughs> Very important to say that. And you're reminding me, I did write a piece. I shared it only with uh, members of the House Call Bed Academy inside of our private Facebook community um, around the birth of my niece. She had a very difficult birth and like it just so many juices were flowing in my head. Like it, it like woke up a certain creativity within myself too. And like as a person who does not have human children and whose name is Eve. So I relate to sort of Mother Earth and like this maternal, like I'm clearly very maternal. I also like refer to myself as like a mama fennec fox, but <laughs> like not, not a mama bear, but a mama fennec fox for some reason just feels like me. I'm like deeply, deeply maternal, but like that sort of metaphorical womb of creation really, really calls to me and it appeals to me. And this piece that I wrote was sort of there there were some folks in the program that were sort of frustrated, like that they hadn't birthed the practice yet. Like they were doing all the prep work and all the foundation stuff. And in my mind, I'm seeing them go, go. I'm like, when you launch, you are going to be a fucking rock star. Like you are so far ahead of the game. I can't, you don't even know right now, like how good this is going to be once you like actually launch. But like when you're in it, you can't see that. And I sort of like wrote this comparison thing between like, you know, you have your gestation period. You can't birth the baby before that. And if you do, you you can, but you'll be in the NICU or you're, you're going to be, you know, it, the pregnancy may not even be viable. Right. And so that gestation period, like it takes time. It takes the creative time in the womb and the preparation and the ways that are needed, right? To birth anything. And so I'm glad that you brought that link, that thread in that was like really actually quite relevant to house call vets and house call vets in progress. So yeah, awesome. 
So, okay. So next subject that I want to talk about, it, it is related and I touched on it just a little bit. So we, we spoke just a little bit about almost like the tension between a childless woman and a woman who is raising children, especially in the veterinary space. Like there can be a little push and pull, a little like maybe you don't understand or maybe I spoke with a dear, dear friend. Um, we were doing medicine work together and what came up like all these maternal creative concepts and she noted something that was really, really interesting to me. And she talked about the idea of righteous resentment for other women who are not mothers. And I, ooh, like that touched me because I intuitively could understand and I had a lot of compassion for it, a lot of empathy for it. And I've also been on the other side of it that someone resents me that I don't have the struggles they have. It's not fair that I can do X, Y, Z or like, you know, I've heard the words said to other people and I've heard other childless or like so-called childless women <laughs> say how much it bothers them when someone says, when you're a mother, you'll understand like how invalidating that can be. And especially in the veterinary space and, in in, you know, like there's just like so, so many interesting points of contact and engagement between women who have children and women who don't. And also what's really interesting is like, I've experienced had people making assumptions like you're not a mother, but what I want to say and what I feel inherently is like, well, you don't actually know if I've miscarried 10 times and I'm grieving the loss of 10 babies that I still feel as my children. You don't know if I'm like desperately trying to conceive and I can't. You don't know if I've had a stillborn born child or lost a child in infancy or like what the grief is or what my identity around or relating to motherhood might be. Maybe I'm in the process of adopting a child or, you know, like there's a million things and there, there's so many ways to identify as a mother that aren't always like written plainly for everyone to see. And I think it can be very painful to women who don't have, you know, physical life children that they're raising to be on the receiving end of this sort of like righteous resentment from the women who are raising children. And and again, I fully understand that. Like, <laughs> it's a fucking lot. It's a lot. And like, you see the struggles. And so it's just, you know, something that's been on my mind at various times. And I, I've seen that that sort of play back and forth, specifically in the veterinary space between women who do and don't have children or parents who do and don't have children. And that sort of dialogue is very interesting to me. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I will say the ways I talk about this depend on who I'm talking to. And so even yeah. though I sort of knew this question was coming, I'm like, how in the world am I going to talk about this on a podcast? <laughs> I have no idea who's listening. And everyone and no one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You know, <laughs> so like, so it's kind of like, all right, well, let's just start with like the principles of therapists. And even though I'm not a trained therapist, being a doula is basically being an unlicensed therapist. Yeah. So first you validate. So like literally no matter what you're hearing or feeling as you're listening to this conversation, it is valid. So like if you're feeling kind of ragey right now because you have been the victim of an angry parent who <laughs> let us step up on you, or if you have been the parent who felt the injustice of being in this cultural moment, you're valid. Like... <laughs> And then after we validate those feelings, then we explore a little bit about what's behind them, right? And I think there's two sets of things behind these kinds of feelings, and they're really different. And that's why it's hard to come together anywhere. And that's because everyone who doesn't currently have living children is on a day-to-day -day basis has more control over their time. Not necessarily money or other resources, because that's going to depend on a whole bunch of other factors. But your time is more open. I mean, yes, you could be spending it on other things that take up a lot of time. You might have other people in your life who you are caregiving, and that's different. I mean, but the point is that time is not dictated by the presence of the small humans, dictated by something else. And so parents sometimes will reach a point where they kind of wish they had more time. And as goes back to that conversation earlier, that flexibility for their careers is incredibly important to them. And they will make decisions about whether they jump ship based on that alone. And so sometimes when they feel pushed 
especially when it comes to time, but also when it comes to other resources, like anybody who feels cornered and pushed, they're going to lash out and they're going to lash out at whoever happens to be there. But if that person has the thing that they perceive that they wish they had, it's coming from a place of jealousy. But you know what jealousy always is? Jealousy means that you have a lack and that you actually need more support on something. And so I think that if it was magically possible for everyone in that moment to be like, I'm sorry, I'm feeling really under-resourced in this moment. And I perceive that you have the resource I, I wish that had. And I acknowledge that you cannot grant me that resource in this moment, but I'm feeling very under-resourced and that is bringing up a lot of feelings for me. And then the other person came back. I recognize that you feel under-resourced in a culture that does not value your time in the way that it probably should. I cannot fix that for you, but I acknowledge that you are experiencing this. I mean, maybe we'd all do better, right? <laughs> but let's face it, as a culture, we're not really great about talking things through, especially in the moment that we're feeling them. And we don't really have any awareness as to why we're feeling them in the moment. And so we just react, right? And then, then what? I don't know. Then depends on the circumstance. If it's the barista, you just walk away and hope they forget. You know, <laughs> if it's the person who you work with every day, you're probably going to have to make some repair. And so like, so yeah, there's, there's like, what are you feeling in that moment? And then from the other side of it, that's from the parent perspective. From the other perspective, either a person cannot have children, hasn't yet chosen to have children, or has chosen not to have children. There's three scenarios here, and you have no idea which person you are talking to, frankly, unless they've made it abundantly clear. And frankly, sometimes people lie, and sometimes people change their minds, and you still don't really know where they are. <laughs> and so those people still know that historically, the cultural norm was to get married and have babies. And that even now, with fewer and fewer people having babies, especially among the millennials, it is still pretty much an expectation that you're going to do it at some point, unless you can't. And then everybody feels sorry for you. And then there's this like tension of like, I, I don't really know that I want you to feel sorry for me. Like, I, it's not really something that I feel like you have any, you need to have any emotions about at all. This is my life. And then there's also like, Okay, what if maybe I think maybe I do, but then I'm not really sure if I'm just listening to like cultural normatives or maybe I just like babies, but I don't actually need to have babies or maybe my spouse wants to have babies and I really don't. And we're having our own internal tensions about it. And now you're layering on. And so like there's two different conversations. One is around feeling under resourced and underappreciated. And the other one is about having expectations that are external being forced upon you. And they're entirely different conversations. And even when we are at our most gracious and our most well-resourced, it's really hard to have conversations where you're not even really talking about the same thing, which is why I don't really have this conversation. That was so, like, so skillfully stated. Like, I'm so impressed, like, how beautiful you just broke that down and explained, like, both the divide and also what the unifying conversation could look like. I mean, I think that the way you broke it down is like an inherent, like immediate, like slip and slide right down into empathy, because like you can't know that about the, the counterpart without being like, oh, uh, I understand, you know. So thank you for that. That was very, very like unifying and I think healing. I hope for our listeners, like wh whatever side of the coin of that kind of conversation one might find ourselves on. So that, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining us for part two with our three-part series with Dr. Emily Yunker. I really hope that you guys are finding these episodes as delightful and enchanting as I am. And I hope you join us for part three. All right, we'll see you then. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the House Callback Cafe. If you enjoyed this episode, then hit the subscribe or follow button on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you never have to miss an episode. This podcast is made specifically for you, so don't be shy if you'd like to reach out and let me know your thoughts on this episode. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook as The House Call Vet Academy, where I also share more valuable content. If you're interested in learning more about consulting for House Call Vets or the House Call Vet Academy online course and community, please click on the link in the show notes. Have an amazing rest of your day, and I can't wait for you to join us for our next episode of the House Call Vet Cafe.